The U. Pre-College Development Academy. Good evening and welcome to PCDA TV, episode six. My name is Robbie Carroll and I'm your host for tonight. Uh, we have started recruiting here at Pre-College Development Academy. So if you are interested and looking to play next year, 2021 academic year, go to precollegeda.com, fill out that application and a member of our coaching staff will touch base with you. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite a very special guest tonight, Gwyn Williams. Gwyn, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you, Robbie. Pleasure to be here. Good lad, good lad. So, Gwyn, the way I like to get started off uh, is basically just ask uh, ask my guests to tell us a, a little bit about uh, about themselves. So uh, I'll let you fire away with that. Okay. Well, uh, I guess I was born in England uh, and I have a very Welsh name. My father was Welsh. Lived uh, lived most of my sort of first eight years in South Wales, where they don't play a lot of uh, soccer. So I started playing rugby. Moved back to just Liverpool uh, at the age of ten. Started playing soccer then. By the age of thirteen, I was on a men's team, so playing against twenty-five and thirty-year-olds. By fourteen, I was signed by a semi-professional team. And at 15, I was signed by Bolton Wanderers. And uh, so uh, my dreams of being a professional footballer were very much alive. And uh, three years later, I blew out my knee and it was basically, uh, what am I going to do? This is not in the plans. And fortunately, I kept up my education and I was able to go to university and train as a phys ed teacher. So that's that's how I got into the uh, the coaching role, and you know, at 18, 19, I was told I'd never play again, uh, but I did, not to the same level, but I played, I actually played until I was nearly 40, but I'd already started that coaching, uh, uh, combining it with, with that, with uh, anything else I could do at the time, training to be a teacher. So I played, I played uh, non-league football, and then uh, I went to Bermuda, uh, I taught for two years in, in England, went to Bermuda where I played, and then I got involved in coaching. Coached with the national team of Bermuda for, for many years while I was there. Uh, eventually moved to Florida where I coached at Lynn University. Uh, became a staff coach for U.S. soccer and the NSCAA. Um, and then uh, I did that for 13 years. And... Um, I then went to New England Revolution with Steve Nittle was the head coach and uh, I was an assistant with Paul Mariner, was another assistant coach. I did that for four years and um, then I became the state director in Alabama, which I, I was the state director and in charge of player development for three years. And eventually, I, then I moved out to Washington State, had a, a couple of years there, went to California uh to work with a friend of mine in a club in california and uh, went back to washington and uh now i'm with the richmond strikers in richmond i moved here simply because my daughter's here and my grandchildren are here uh, <laughs> so i'm now very much involved with coaching education with the richmond strikers brilliant so you uh you, i think you've taken the the, the king journeyman uh, title away from uh, Steve Richards there, our very own Steve Richards. Uh, you've uh, been around everywhere. I thought I'd moved around quite a bit, but uh, wow, that's uh, quite a quite a journey you've had so far. Absolutely, uh, and I guess the the key is you're always learning, uh, so you can just keep learning. And you know, I've been lucky. I've been lucky. I've worked with some wonderful people. Uh, you know, I, I've been on uh, the old Olympic development coaching staff for 25 years, dealt with a lot of high-level kids uh, from this country who've gone on to play for the national teams, uh, whether the youth national teams or full national team. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been my pleasure to, to work in soccer in the United States since I've been here since late 1993. So, Wow. Well, I've got a, a little story for you. I'm sat here in the US right now. Um, I was actually recruited... Uh, by your colleague, 
um, in 2005 to come and play for Lynn. But um, I can't remember the full story, but um, <laughs> I was sent to Tyler Junior College. Uh, okay. And the funny story about that is my uh, your, your colleague, Sean Pendleton there, yeah, sure. um, he came over to England on a recruitment trip. I think he was visiting home, but he, he popped over to one of a, a, a college game I was supposed to be playing in because he'd heard about, you know, this goalkeeper from Wakefield who's, you know, who's not quite all there, but he's he's pretty good. And uh, he came to watch this game and he, he was like, oh, wow, I like that goalkeeper. Is that that, that kid you were talking about? And the bloke who, uh, who was coaching at the time said, no, no, you that's not that's not Rob Carroll. If you if you like that goalkeeper, you'll really like Rob. So Sean says, "Where is Rob? Oh, he's playing for England in Italy." Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So Sean Sean never actually saw me play, but I he, I landed back on the Saturday, and I had a voicemail waiting for me when I walked through the door, and it was Sean on the phone saying, "Hey, I want you to come and play for me." Yeah. Oh, that's good. So yeah. yeah. No, I, I I Sean. I actually met Sean. While I was in Bermuda, uh, he had just got his first coaching job at the University of Charleston, West Virginia. He took two players from Bermuda, did a fantastic job with those players. Then when he moved to Lynn, uh, we, we always kept in touch. And when I was moving to America, uh, Sean persuaded me to go and be his, his, his assistant in Boca Raton, Florida. So that's how I, that's how I got to Lynn. And uh, I worked with Sean for 13 years before I went to the revolution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, he, he really had to twist your arm to go to Boca Raton, Florida, huh? It's a tough, it was a tough gig. Tough gig. <laughs> well, well, while you were there, you had some great successes, uh, conference title, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and also a, a division two national championship in 2003. 2003. That's correct. Yes. It's, it's funny because, uh, you know, soccer is a strange game at times, and there were many years we had a you know very good teams, uh, and somehow found a way to get eliminated in the playoffs. We, I think it was nineteen ninety seven. We actually went to the final uh, and were playing the final at home and managed to lose. Uh, but uh, the year we won it, we had nine freshmen, and, and at the start of that campaign, we basically said, "This is." this is the worst team we've ever had. Uh, not that they were bad, but they, in terms of experience, they were they were very young. And we right. said, if we, if we qualify for the playoffs, this will be a good year. <laughs> and that was that was the year we went unbeaten and won it. So uh, that's how that's how strange football can be at times. That's right. Sure. I hundred percent agree with that. So. Um, when I when I have guests on, I like to do a little bit of research, and uh, one story about you just pops up. Um, you're a bit of a hero, aren't you? I I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well, I wouldn't say that. No, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna jog your memory. American Airlines Flight Seven Twenty Five. Oh yes, yes, American Airlines. I, I I remember it well. Yes. Can you give us that story? Oh, that story. Sure. Uh, Revolution are flying from Boston to Los Angeles, um, and uh, we are we're delayed a little bit going out of Logan. We're actually going to play Chivas uh, in LA, and there was a woman sat next to me who suddenly, when they announced that they were closing the the the, the doors, she started panicking and she had a panic attack. So I had to take her off. Uh, we're about an hour delayed because they got to get her and her husband's luggage off. And then uh, we finally get in the air and uh, this guy goes into the bathroom. Uh, and at the point he comes out of the bathroom, he's absolutely naked, <laughs> uh, which is uh, not a good thing on an airplane. And uh, he proceeds to go and sit down uh, about two rows behind me and uh, the stewards are panicking and, and throwing blankets over him. They eventually decide they're going to keep flying and he'll be arrested when we get to Los Angeles. So a bit, bit later on in the flight, it gets up to go to the bathroom again and the guy tries to open the emergency exit door next to ne uh, in, in the row I'm in. And uh, I was with the uh, Revolution general manager and the director of player personnel 
we jumped on him and subdued him uh and eventually that we you know the stewards put these plastic handcuffs on him and stuff like that and then from that point the plane was on a lockdown and straight down to Oklahoma City where he was removed and we had to give statements and things like that um and when we got actually it's funny because there was a uh, I presume it was an air marshal came and sat next to me and said, this will be a big deal when we get to Los Angeles and didn't realize uh, a lot of media and all the hype uh, uh, about this guy. But uh, that was uh, an interesting flight to Los Angeles. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, I'll tell you. But I, I, I wouldn't class myself as a hero. It was just a, it really was it was just a reflex action. When somebody's pulling on that door, uh, and I didn't realize, but those doors are, you know, I don't know what elevation we were at, 30 something thousand feet, it would probably wouldn't open at that elevation. You got to go a lot lower before it would open. So, uh, but okay. a scary moment, nevertheless. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Um, Trademark uh, tra travel in the US, you meet all sorts of people, don't you? So that's uh, yeah. that's the one thing I like to tell everybody back home. You yeah. you, you can meet some I've, some cracking folk. <laughs> I've not had many flights like that, fortunately. So I'll <laughs> another one. Well, that's that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Right, let's get back to the uh, the, the football. Uh, yeah. Just a quick reminder to our viewers: if you have any questions for uh, Gwyn, make sure you go ahead and leave them in the comments. And I will get to them as soon as I can. Back to Gwyn. Uh, Gwyn, who was your biggest soccer influence mm. growing up, and that's, why? That's yeah, no, I had a I, I had an uncle, uh, Malcolm Norman, that played for Bristol Rovers. So I was a very young child. My dad used to take me to watch Cardiff City. Uh, I was so young, I used to stand on his shoulders uh, uh, and watch the games. Um, and I can remember watching uh, Bristol Rovers play Manchester United. I, I'm assuming it was a, an FA Cup game because they were in different divisions. And that really started my sort of romance with Manchester United as a very young child. And, and I was only six when the Munich air crash uh, occurred. Uh, and that was obviously a, a terrible disaster. And that had a, a big impact on me. And then obviously a few years later... I, I moved to Liverpool, where most of uh, most of my buddies support Liverpool or Everton, and uh, I had this uh, really inkling to to follow Manchester United from the air crash as a very young kid. So, and then the days of Bobby Charlton, George Best, and Dennis Law were just uh, great, you know, great football days. So they that was really what sparked my enthusiasm as, as a young child and then uh I, you know I, I never had a coach until until i signed uh till i signed for a non-league club uh you know semi-professional uh, it was the first time i'd ever ever had a coach so uh, that that uh, you just played for fun and uh if you were if you were good you got recognized and got invited to play in better teams they did the the old way of doing it, I guess. Yeah, um, no, very much so. Wasn't that uh, Jimmy Murphy used to scour the Manchester leagues, basically uh, yeah. looking for uh, young talent for the Bus to add to the Busby Babes. Yeah. Jimmy was the assistant to Matt Busby. Yeah, very much so. So, and of course, I I signed for Bolton uh, as a youth player, and Nat Lofthouse was that was the manager, and uh, you know Nat Lofthouse was uh, a legend uh in england in those days so it was uh it was great to play at uh what had been a very famous and big club uh at that point in time yeah what about as a coach who was your main influencer or influencers uh, it's interesting roy reese was the coach of skemmersdale when i was a young you know i was only 14 uh but the uh you know, the first team goalkeeper, uh, Terry Crosby, w was the England amateur goalkeeper. So I was a goalkeeper. So, and I'm only a kid in the reserves, but, you know, I was uh, I was able to train. And in, in those days, there were no subs. Uh, and then it became one sub, but it was never the goalkeeper. So I always trained with the first teams. 
because uh, they, they they needed two goalkeepers. And then um, I guess it really when I went to PE college, uh, I was introduced to a gentleman called Joe Musson, who was he was an FA staff coach, uh, and he was the influence that guided me really to go on to be a the PE teacher that I was uh, and got into coaching while I was I was at Nonington College of Physical Education in England. So that, that would be a big influence on me. Brilliant. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, go into a little bit more detail of your uh, time with uh, the New England uh, Revolution? Oh, yeah. No, it was um, – I joined, I think it was the end of 2006. Um, Steve Nickel was the head coach. Uh, Steve, Steve had actually came to the U.S. to be the player coach for the uh, Boston Boston Bolts, I think it was called, or Boston, yeah, Boston Bolts. While he was in that position, he became the assistant coach uh, at New England, um, and there was. Uh, there was a point in time, I think Fernando Clavillo, uh was the head coach and he was fired. Steve was put in charge with something like six games to go and he won most of those six games and made the playoffs and they offered him the job full time. And Steve, Steve's first hire was to bring in Paul Mariner as his assistant. Um, I didn't join. I, I'm not sure what they, they'd been together for a few years. Uh by the time I got there, they'd already been to two MLS Cup finals, uh, and and they'd lost both of those. So we ended up going to four MLS Cup finals uh, consecutive years and losing all four. But Steve Steve was unique uh, as a coach. He really the players adored playing for him. Uh, he really understood the game got the best out of players. He was a fantastic man manager. Um, and the, I think the, the, the part of the success and, and it, you know, uh, you like to think that you added a little bit to, to, uh, to the program when you go there, but Steve and Paul had really established a good rapport. Uh, they'd recruited well. Uh, and, and in those days, recruiting local players was a bigger bigger part of the league than it is today. Uh, there's not as many opportunities for American players today as there were back in 2006. So, uh, but uh, Steve, Paul and I were the, we were the, you know, it was a small coaching staff. We were very close. Uh, we had a great trust between us. Uh, we enjoyed our job. We had a lot of fun. Uh, and, we, you know, the football side of things was very serious, uh, and we, so it was uh, it was my pleasure to work there, work with some very good players, um, and overall it was very good. Um, and I made the decision to leave at the time. I had a uh, a young young family, and uh, you know, uh, I decided that job security was not, you know. In professional soccer, it's the easiest job in the world as long as you win. Um, <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, so I so I made the decision uh, to go and be the director of coaching in Alabama. Um, Paul had just left as well to go to Plymouth Argyle in England. And um, I knew about Alabama because I, of the ODP uh, with Region 3. And, you know, I was a staff coach for Florida before – be, uh, you know, with the ODP program. So uh, I had three good years in Alabama after that. Brilliant. Um, so you, you had some big successes at the top level of um, soccer in, in the US. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that you, was it the two finals that you made it in the MLS Cup? But yeah, uh, didn't, didn't win. But you did win a US Open Cup, am I? Yes, we did. Yeah, we did 2007. Um, we beat Dallas uh, in Dallas to win that, to win that. And, uh, you know, in, in, it's, it's funny because in, in those days uh, we only had a very small squad and, there were, you know, there were times where you didn't, you didn't really take the U.S. Open Cup that seriously. Uh, your bread and butter was the league. 
Um, and we had this competition called the Superliga, which was the top four teams from Mexico versus the top four teams from the US, from MLS. Um, so we played mostly the reserve players. And there was in those days, there was no reserve league as such. Um, uh, so you know, we we got to the we got to the final basically with the reserves, and then uh, played the first team and beat Dallas in the final to win it. So it was good, good experience yeah. for, for all the players. Good. So so far, then in your like um, club and above um, positions, you you've won silverware every, every team you've pretty much been with, right? Above the U eighteen level. Sure. That? Yeah. That's what you play for. That, yep, that's it. That's it. And yeah. you're making my little tin cup in my closet look terrible now. So, uh. no, actually, we, we, we uh, when I was with the Revolution, you know, I told you the Superliga, uh, the four top teams in Mexico, uh, they're no slouches. And, and we won that in 2008. Um, it was interesting because both we got, we'd lost the previous two MLS Cup finals to Houston. And we played Houston in the final of that uh, and beat them on, I think it was nil nil, and we beat them on penalties to win it. So uh, um, I'm assuming you did most of the work with the, uh, with the goalkeepers. Yes. Yeah. I used to, I, I, used, I had very fortunate. I had uh, Matt Reese was already there. Uh, very good goalkeeper. Uh, for me, he was the best goalkeeper in major league soccer in those days. Um, his appearances in the national team were greatly reduced. I think he only played a couple of times simply because of Casey Keller, Brad Friedel, Jurgen Sommer. Uh, the, you know, we had a, the country had a host of good goalkeepers in those days. And then uh, I brought in Brad Knighton, who is still there today. He's, he left and he's been to, he's been to other clubs, but he's, he's back there now. So I brought Brad in in 2007. And then in 2008, I brought in Bobby Shuttleworth, who's still playing in the league. Uh, so that you know, it's good. It's good that they've had long careers in Major League Soccer. Yeah, um, and, and to be fair, I mean, it's goalkeeping, especially if you can stay um, injury free. For for example, you can yeah. you can probably get up to that. 38, 40 mark can play. David Seaman managed it. Brad Friedel was up there. Yeah. So. I tell you, uh, in fact, to, to your listeners, I, I'll, I'll tell you a true story about uh, Matt Reese. Matt, Matt Reese grew up in California, did not play for a big club. He played for his local club. Uh, he went to UCLA, uh, big Division One program, and he was the backup goalkeeper for three years. He played one year as the starting goalkeeper. He won the national championship that year with UCLA. He was drafted by the uh, LA Galaxy. Uh, and he spent, I'm trying to think, he probably, I think it was about six years on the bench. And in that six years, he only played 16 games. Uh, he went to the New England Revolution and he was the backup goalkeeper to Aidan Brown for another two and a half years. So uh, eventually got his chance, uh, took it, and he was the out-and-out -out number one for the next nine years. So, uh, you know, Matt was really a backup goalkeeper, working at his trade, pushing hard every day for for 10 years between university and, and uh, major league soccer, uh, more than 10 years, and uh, went on to have a great career as a professional, great professional. Uh, after he went out of playing, he became the goalkeeper coach for the Galaxy, and then when Bruce got the national team job, he went as the national team's goalkeeper coach. He's currently working for FC Barcelona. Uh, here in the United States, so uh, you know it was a, it was my pleasure to 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 work with Matt every day. Uh, made my job very easy. Lovely, lovely. So we have a uh, a question here, and I, I guess yeah. Steve sat sat on the edge of his chair right now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up on the screen and, and give yeah. it a read. So Steve said, "Ask ask Gwyn, um about 
and Peter Mello writing the first goalkeeper license for Florida Youth Soccer. Also, his development, uh, player development opinion approach. Okay. Um, he's putting me on the spot, isn't he? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, firstly, Peter Mello, um, you know, was a, uh, a long time professional goalkeeper in England for Manchester City, Burnley. Fulham and Portsmouth, and then he he came to play in the NASL um, for his last year or may have been two years. Um, became a club director in Florida. I I started off in Florida. Uh, that's where I, I first met Peter. Um, Peter was working with the under twenty national team when I first met him, um, and then he became the director of co goalkeeping coaching for the federation. Uh, I became his sort of lieutenant in Region 3, uh, and we wrote a, a, a curriculum for Florida together, and then we wrote the National Coaches Goalkeeper Coaches License for U.S. soccer. Uh, uh, you know, Peter and I were two of four people that, that wrote that, um, that curriculum. So uh, Peter and I worked together uh, for many, many years, still worked together, uh, play development, and Part of our job was really to uh, to establish a core of co goalkeeper coaching coaches in every state in the country. Uh, and we, you know, I was over Region 3. There was a Region 1, 2, and 4. Um, and our real task was to get everybody on the same page, uh, coaching the principles of the game. And, and that brought about you know, uh, a lot of good goalkeepers. I, I spent two years with uh, Mitch Murray. With the I was the goalkeeper coach with the under eighteen national team uh, at the time, and um, so working with Peter was, was uh, a you know is one of my mentors really, uh, and one of Peter's mentors was Tony Waiters was another mentor of mine uh, that I assisted in you know in scouting capacity with Canada. So uh, now in terms of development, uh, you know, the one thing about the goalkeeping position, uh, it, it's, it's probably the least favorite for, for a lot of kids. They don't want to play it. Uh, usually selection is uh, if you can't get on the, on the field in another position, then you can go in goal sort of thing. But uh, it, it is singularly the most important position on the field. Uh, if you're going to win anything, you better have a good goalkeeper because if you don't, they will find ways of letting you know at the wrong times that they're not a good goalkeeper. Um, <laughs> so you know we we, uh, we take pride in, uh, in in all the youngsters that we helped. You know, uh, many many kids went on to play. You know, literally dozens and dozens of kids went on to play in college. Probably 20, 20 kids that we've sort of had at some point uh, have gone on to play in Major League Soccer, uh, which is, you know, I think back to you know, people like Nick Romando, Tim Howard, um, you know, th there have been a lot of goalkeepers that have gone on to play for the national team. So that that's, you know, th that's – and by the way, that they've got there because of their ability, not, not because of Peter and I, but, you know, it was just our pleasure to work with them. Yeah, but as a, as a goalkeeper coach, though, you do have to accept some responsibility for um, the successes of, of the players that you worked with. Um, you know, I mean, for, I was I was coached a lot by a, a chap called Phil Hughes. I don't know whether you uh, know or remember him. Um, I know. He I, not, I, actually, he I, I know of him. Uh, I don't. I've never met him, but I, I do know of him. He's at Man United, wasn't he? He was in Northern yeah. Ireland uh, international, yeah. and his claim to fame was uh, he came on for the last twenty minutes against England, and uh, Gary Lineker popped two past him. Yeah. Um, well, he, he was my goalkeeper coach, and he encouraged me to go everywhere I could to pick up yeah. one thing yeah. from different coaches. That's why I say you're always learning, and you, and you take bits from everybody, and and you've got to make it you you you've got to build it into you. Um, and some things work for some people, but not for others. So right. you know that that that's that's why I said at the beginning you're always learning. That's 
True. Right, we've got another question here, and I'm going to have to throw it on because he's he's probably asking it from a beach. It's from our CEO, Ryan Hodgson. Yeah. He's asked, do keepers have too much protection nowadays? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, bear in mind, I I played the game as a, as a kid where the rule was if there was no post-mortem, there was no foul. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then it was if there was no x-ray, there's no foul. And today, if uh, if there's a hint of a bruised ego uh, or, or you know it's a foul, but they they are they are overprotected, and no question. Um, I and don't pretend to understand referees. I've, I've never uh, worried about them. Uh, they're going to give what they give, but in my mind, they do overprotect the goalkeeper. Yeah, and I think that's allowed my main complaint especially with the flashy goalkeepers these days is they've become soft yeah the, the you know the the goalkeeper position today is, is very different from when i played that's for sure now don't forget when i was a kid but when i started playing organized football you could charge the goalkeeper that was allowed you know um it's uh you know those days are long gone um <laughs> so it is a different game today, very much so. Yeah, I mean, wasn't it? You could charge the goalkeeper even if he had it. He picked it up. You could literally oh. just go kick him and and grab take you, the ball out of his hands with your foot you, you and put it in the back of the net. You, you could charge him with your shoulder as long as it wasn't in his back. Uh, <laughs> that was it. And if you go on YouTube, it was the 1958 FA Cup final where uh, Nat Lofthouse. Hits the Manchester United goalkeeper very early and knocks him over the line and uh, knocked him out. Uh, of course, there was no subs in those days, uh, but that was legal. So, uh, different game. Different yeah. Game. Very yeah. Much so. <laughs> that's, that's just crazy. I think, to be fair, I think I've seen that video um, in the Manchester United Museum uh, yeah. in the little goalkeeper uh, exhibition there. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a funny one. Right. Back to the uh, the uh, all about you, Gwyn. Uh, you were a founding um, advisory board member of the Football Coaches Association of is it African or African nations? African African nations, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah I, can you I, tell I, us about how you got involved with that and what your sure. duties were? Actually, a, a very minor role, really. Um, I was the director of coaching for Alabama, in, and the director in the state next to me, Mississippi, was a Nigerian or former Nigerian, uh, Terry Aguaji, Dr. Terry Aguaji. Um, and at the time, I was sort of doing some collaboration work with him and with basically his state and my state. Um, and he had this idea of helping out Africa, you know, where he came from. Uh, and I'd been to Africa looking for players with the revolution and uh, uh, they have they have a different set of problems than we have. Um, so Terry wanted to put together a coach uh, coaching licensing program based on, on, on really what we were doing here in the US. Um, uh, and I don't take any credit for it, but Terry was doing uh, all the, the donkey work and, uh, People like Sam Snow, who was the national director. D Jacob Daniels was the regional director. We became sort of consultants to Terry in formulating a curriculum that would work for the African nations. And, and Terry's still doing that, and it's going well. So I was just happy to help him. Cool. That, that's a cool story. And, uh, you know, I think I – think, um... You know, it's something you can look back out, uh, back on, and be proud of. And especially when we are seeing good coaches, as well as the the fruit of the good coaching coming out of the African nations now. Yeah. Um, and you know, just just knowing that you had, you you know, just a little bit of a uh, a fingerprint on that. Yeah. No, I, I tell you, you know, they have very different problems. Um, they, you know, they don't have uh, the facilities that we have here in the U.S. All their their players can play. Uh, they they've got incredible technique. Um, they lack a organization. Uh, they lack planning. Uh, things like that. So it, it's 
it's it's the same game, but the emphasis is on different problems there. Um, and it's always, you know, uh, going scouting for players in Africa, there are players everywhere. Um, they have other problems adjusting to life in America. You know, it's some of them, when they, especially when they're young, it's difficult for them to come out of Africa and make it because they get homesick. Um, you know, there, there are some real just different problems that, that you face with the African players. They're fantastic players. Fantastic people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know uh, my my roommate, uh, my sophomore year in college was from South Africa and uh, he'd often talk about home and you could see it in his eyes. It was, it was killing him to be here, but he realised he had to be here mm -hmm. in the US, you know, and... Yeah. Um, but you could tell, like, it was a little bit different. I mean, obviously, I'm a northern, northeast English lad. Like, I take it as it comes and, and that kind of stuff. I just wasn't expecting that from, a, you know, South Africa. I thought he'd be a tough guy, you know, and, and a, a nutcase like I was. But uh, it turns out he, he was a little bit more um, well-behaved than, uh, you know, normal chap, really. Right. So... We've got another comment. Ryan's getting into this one now. Uh, he said, uh, wave a magic wand, Gwyn. Uh, what's one problem you'd like to solve? And I'm assuming, Mr. Hodgson, you're talking about U.S. soccer and, and uh, about, or soccer hope, in the U.S. Yeah, I, I hope he's talking about a football problem. Um, <laughs> if there's one problem, boy, I could think of a thousand problems. But uh, uh, before I say that, I'm going to make a statement to you. I'm going to tell you that Probably the four countries that have made the most improvement in terms of world football in the last 25 years would include Australia, Japan, South Korea, and the United States. And I'm talking from the men's side because uh, for, for really all of that period, the U.S. women's have been the, the best program in the world, but the men's hasn't been. Um, uh the American game is based on having to pay to play. That's uh, that, that's it's not that's not how can I say this? It, that's not a problem in some ways, but it is in others. The biggest problem is that the access to better levels of of soccer in this country you've got to pay for. Uh, and, and if I could solve that, because there are many, many kids that that can't afford to pay travel soccer. Um, so we miss out. And, and those kids are, by and large, uh, they come from an ethnic background uh, where, where their family history is steeped in soccer, whether that's from Asia, Africa, Central or South America. Um, and I don't think, you know, we're getting those. Uh, the, the other side of this is uh, today, kids in America, the, there's, there isn't the freedom to, of unstructured play. And that hinders soccer in all its development. Uh, kids now, they're entering structured coaching programs from the age of six or five. Um, that does us no favors. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's a bit too soon. I think I was seven when I had my first uh, training session, and I showed up with jeans and a hoodie on. I think, um, yeah. And you know, in Wakefield, I got laughed at, probably punched a few times, and that was just the coach. Never mind the other kids. But you know, I'm sure we'll get on to this eventually. But I say to kids, like, what's soccer's magic number? And I'm usually so there's usually a long silent pause. Uh, and then somebody will come up with the number 11 because there's 11 players on the field. Uh, and I said to him, no, it's 24. And they look at me with a blank expression. And I said, because there's 24 hours in the day for an American kid, for a Brazilian kid, for an African kid or any other kid. And it's what you do in that 24 hours. And I say to him, let's assume that you, you're at work or sleep for eight hours. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, that this still leaves you about eight to ten hours uh, a day. And how many of those hours do you devote to soccer? I mean, the kids I'm coaching in, in the club I'm at now, which is a very good club, they probably don't touch a soccer ball outside of working with the 
with their team uh whereas the african kid and the brazilian kid they're playing soccer eight hours a day uh and i said to him and you want to know why they're better than us um so that's that's a cultural thing here um you know and that that unstructured play i can come back to that is an ingredient that's very much missing uh and and, and of course society is different today when i was a kid growing up you got kicked out of the house straight after breakfast and uh you were you were expected to make a five minute appearance for lunch get back out there and we'll call you when dinner's ready and you played with the football you know for the re all those hours um kids don't do that today they they probably may do it on video games uh working left and right thumb uh sitting on a couch so that's a that's a fact of where we are different society yeah i i find myself obviously i grew up uh late 80s early 90s was my you know outside and in in before it's dark you know when those street lights come on it's time to come in and yeah. I, I had pretty much the same similar thing it was like you know i'd i'd say oh i'm bored and my dad would say are you in a wheelchair yeah no. say no and he says we'll get outside and play football then so you know i mean that that i think that generation is 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 kind of gone a little bit and uh you know i think these kids they need somewhere to go and play i don't think you know especially if they live in what i like to call the concrete jungles the big cities there's u.s soccer are trying to bring those safe places to play but yeah. there's not that much opportunity where you can just go find a field that's safe and kick a ball about anymore correct absolutely you know it's uh and 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 parents understandably are protective of their children you know especially especially the younger ones you know they're, they're not going to just let them wander off uh without being supervised these days uh, and safety is obviously a, a great concern yeah yeah right i'm with point blank question you know i'm sure you're aware of uh, pre-college development academy and yes, uh, I am. our, our yeah. programming what yeah. are your thoughts on the program listen I, I think anything you can do to help kids get further in this game and, and one of the one of the great things about america is that there are so many universities uh, that offer such diverse programs. And if you want to play foot soccer, uh, there's opportunities. Now, the, the, the opportunities to play on the top programs are, are limited uh, because it, they can only, you know, they can only field so many players. They've only, uh, and everybody's chasing the soccer scholarship dream. Uh, so I would say the more opportunities you have to learn as a, as a young player now with, a, with a desire to go to college and there's two sides of it. There's the academic side, uh, because the chances of you playing professional are very slim. Um, so you've got to be smart and, and work out what you want to do for the rest of your life. And, uh, I, I tell kids, if you work hard for the 13 years of, of school, chances are uh you you'll make it okay in college and you'll have the rest of your life will be a lot easier than if you don't work hard um so uh the excellence is always excellence is always noticed and it's always rewarded however when you're when you're a soccer player looking for a college place there's it's easy to find the top players it's easy to weed out the weak players but now you're comp competing with masses of people for very few places in college programs, and you could be the you could be the best striker on the field. But if the coach college coach turns up to watch your game and he's looking for a right back, uh, you know, so there's a little bit of good fortune in, in anything you do for sure. But kids that want to go to college should take every opportunity to get involved with programs such as yours uh, because it's only going to help them open doors that wouldn't open otherwise. So, and, and, and not every lead will, will lead to an offer for them to play for college. And you've just got, you know, success is getting up one more time than you've been knocked down. And uh, my mother never saw me play, but when anything went wrong in my life, she only used to say one thing to me, what do you want to do about it? And uh, and I'm so grateful now 
that I understand what she she meant. You know, do, if if you don't, if it doesn't bother you, don't worry about it. Move on. Uh, if if it if it does bother bother you, get off your backside and and get going again and change the result. So uh, kids kids need to know that uh, just being told no isn't the end. They've got to keep going. So I, I commend programs like like yours. That that's uh, that really there's a big need for it um, because uh, there's an ignorance of parents and and kids. Um, they assume they could just got to sit at home because their kid plays on a travel team and somebody's going to call the house one day and offer them a place on a college program. And if they're good, they'll offer them scholarship money. Um, and really, the kids need to market themselves. They've got to be, show desire and hunger, and they've got to be realistic about that as well. So that's where you can educate them what is realistic for them. You know? Yeah, um, I know that's one thing uh, we are going to be announcing. I'm sure people have seen the ticker at the bottom of the screen. We are going to be uh, announcing uh, the PCDA uh, combine location and dates um, in the next week or so. Mm -hmm. um one of the one of the key parts of the combine is the we are going to be giving each player that attends the combine uh you know no frills assessment we think you <coughs> after a year with us or two years with us we think you could be this level you know and the, i think one of the main things and i i think we're all everybody at pcda you know we don't have time to uh, blow the smoke no. Um, you know, it's it's, no, it's, it's you want to help the kids get to their next level. Some ninety percent of the kids don't know it. But Robbie, it's also your reputation that's on the line as well. You you're not going to recommend somebody to a college coach that you're not comfortable with. You've got you've got you've got to be sure uh, of of what you're doing, and because your reputation can very quickly uh, get destroyed if you're sending people inferior products. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, when I was a community college coach, that was the main thing I told all my players was, if you you, you don't pull the weight in the classroom, in the community, or on the field, I'm not going to recommend you to move on. Yeah, um, you know. And then there's some players that come up to me and say, "Coach, can you put a word in for me with this coach?" I was like, no, "I've got a great relationship with him. Yeah, you've been an idiot for two years. Why would I help you?" So yeah, yep. there is that, and and you know the the thing is. You you will establish your program will establish a rapport with the college coaches, uh, and the better that rapport is, the easier it will be for you to open doors for kids. But but you know that they've they've got to have earned that right to have that door open. That's right. Sure. The, uh, Absolutely. I, I'm, so, gonna, I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna tell you a story, but you go ahead and ask you ask you. The next question. Oh, go, go ahead. We like I like stories. I'll, I'm going to tell you a true story. Peter Meller and myself were running a goalkeeper coach, uh, goalkeeper combine for Major League Soccer for the start of the second year of Major League Soccer. So that would have been in 1997. We had there were only 10 teams in the league that that time, and we had 64 goalkeepers. And one of those 64 goalkeepers that was trying out for, for a spot in Major League Soccer was an 18-year-old called Tim Howard. <laughs> and Tim Howard, although Tim at that point was on the uh, under-18 national team, um, Tim was not going to college. Uh, academics at that point in his life were, were not an option for him. And... Uh, out of those 64, Tim did not have a good weekend. And we had this, we had essentially a session on a Friday afternoon, two sessions on Saturday, one on Sunday morning, and then we had to recommend half a dozen goalkeepers that would go then to the full combine for Major League Soccer. Um, and after that event, we go back to the hotel. It was in Fort Lauderdale. Peter and I sat with Tim Howard for the best part, probably an hour and a half. And Tim Howard was going to give up playing. He he saw no he saw no future in soccer for him because he had he had not made you know he had not made the six 
uh, in, all, in all honesty, he was closer to number 64 than he was to number one. Um, and Peter and I persuaded him, listen, you're young. You've just been knocked back. You've got to keep going. And Peter, Peter said to him, listen, uh, the, the, there's a team called the Long Island Rough Riders. They want you to play for them. It's not Major League Soccer. It's a lower division. But if you, you, you go there and play and keep working, if you're good enough, they'll find you. And two, uh, actually, I think he only played there for one year before he signed for what was the uh, New York Metro Stars, which was the forerunner to the Red Bulls. Uh, and their number one goalkeeper was Tony Miola, who was the national team goalkeeper at the time. So Tim became the backup to him. Two years later, they sell Tony Miola to Kansas because they feel that Tim is doing everything that he can do. Um, and he played for two or three years for the Red Bulls, and next thing he's at Manchester United. Uh, so, But on that day, on that Sunday in Fort Lauderdale, 1997, Tim was going to give up playing soccer, all because it went wrong for him in a tryout. So, uh, and your kids have to understand, you you know, all the planets have got to be aligned in that tryout. I'm just my, my computer unplugged itself. Uh, you know, so you should be disappointed if you don't make something, but it's not the end of the world. And as my mother would say, if you don't make it, what do you want to do about it? That's your choice. I'll tell you what. I if uh, if Ryan was on the show right now, he'd ask you to do a mic drop because that was that. I think that we're nearing the end of our time, but I think that's the best way to end the show right there. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? I think that's that's when my son is old enough to understand what what I'm actually talking about. I'm going to be saying that to him. Um, yeah, I think that's you uh, Robbie. You can't do it for them. That, that's the thing is you can't. Too many parents today live vicariously through their kids, and they 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 want the best for their kids. They never want them to fail, but you learn from failure. That's what makes you better, you know. Um, and parents need to know that there's nothing wrong with failing at soccer. It's do they do they want to do something about it? And if they don't, it wasn't for them. Find another passion. Find your passion. Soccer's got to be your passion. For sure. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, Gwen, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I found oh. it absolutely unbelievable. I had, a, I had a great time talking with you, and I'd uh, I'd love to get you back on the show again. Any, um, anytime, anytime, Robert. And listen, I'm sorry that uh, I didn't get to coach you at Lynn University. So, <laughs> You know, things happen. Um, I actually went back to Tyler Junior College after, um, after playing uh, – over in, in Norway and Sweden for a while. And uh, while I was coaching there at Tyler, I met my uh, my missus and the, the mother of my son. So, uh, you know, things happen for a reason. That's We're true. not sure at the time why, but... You make the most of what you've got. That's all you can do. That's it. That's it. Well, uh, Steve Richards has put another one in. I tell you what, you've got a massive fan there. He's put top man going. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. I've had a blast. I'm sure our viewers have had a blast. This has probably been the most uh, feedback we've got on a show so far. Um, okay. So, hey, popular man, Gwyn, and thank you very much for yeah. uh, coming on. Anytime, anytime. Thank you for having me, and uh, good luck to you and your program, and uh, keep the kids playing. Will do, will do. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend, mate. All the best. Cheers. Ta-ra. Well, guys, that's all the time we've got for uh, this week. Join us next week where we will have Lee Squires, the head soccer coach at Lander University. My name is Robbie Carroll. This is PCDA TV. Have a great weekend.